Hello and welcome to today's webinar, Ensuring Your Compliance Program is Defensible to Regulators and Others, brought to you by Quantivate. Before we get started, a few housekeeping items. All participants are in listen-only mode. If you have any questions, feel free to submit them at any point during the webinar in the question tab on your control panel. We'll have time for Q&A at the end, and if we don't get to your question, we'll follow up with you. Today's webinar is being recorded. All registrants will receive a follow-up email with access to the recording and presentation slides after the event concludes. I'd like to introduce today's presenter. With over 27 years of experience, Michael Rasmussen is an internationally recognized pundit on governance, risk management, and compliance, with specific expertise on the topics of enterprise GRC, GRC technology, corporate compliance, and policy. Now, let's kick it over to Michael. It is a pleasure to be here today with everybody, and I'm looking forward to this next virtual hour on ensuring your compliance program is defensible to regulators and others. Those others, we, as we unpack it, could be external auditors, stakeholders, uh, opposing counsel in a lawsuit, you name it. But how do we make a defensible compliance program? Um, so let's begin. So there's a lot of compliance pressures on banks and credit unions. One thing is you have frequency of change, changing laws, rules, regulations, enforcement actions. In, in fact, I mean, it, on the global scale for financial services, according to Thomson Reuters, there's 257 regulatory change events every business day coming from 1,217 regulators of financial services around the world. Approximately one third of those are in the United, or well, North America, the United States and Canada. Uh, and, and so th that's a lot of change that we have to deal with. Uh, but then we have different global contexts we have to deal with, expansion into new markets, evolving risks, hordes and hordes of regulatory information sources, but the need, as in today's presentation, to have defensible compliance. How do we defend the organization? How do we demonstrate that the organization has crossed its T's and dotted its I's correctly in context of compliance? Well, let's first spend a couple minutes just finding how not to have defensible compliance. Too often, compliance programs in, in banks and credit unions remind me of the Winchester Mystery House in San Jose, California. This was a sprawling mansion that was built in the 1800s. And in fact, I just walked by it last week when I was in, in San Jose, California. But, but it was a sprawling mansion built in the 1800s. It cost $5.5 million to build in the 1800s. That's one very expensive house today when you calculate inflation. Um, it, 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 had, it took 38 years to build had 147 different builders, uh, it, but it had no design, no blueprint, no architect. So at the end of the day, it's got doors that open to walls or doors that open 20 foot drops, staircases that go up or down to nowhere, skylights that are in floors instead of ceilings. You know, that's a lot of compliance programs in banks and credit unions that over the last 38 years, you had 147 different builders of compliance doing their little thing. I've got to do this compliance assessment. I've got to manage IT security compliance. I've got to manage privacy compliance. I've got to manage, uh, you know, some other aspect of compliance, you know, uh, money laundering uh, or whatever it might be. And we're like each focused on our little piece of it and not thinking big picture of how could this be designed? How should we approach compliance in the bank and credit union uh, so that it, it works better and more efficiently and more effectively? In fact, you know, what we have is often confusing communications. It's like Hercules battling the Hydra. Hercules had many battles to fight. One was against the multi-headed dragon, the Hydra. You cut off one of its heads and multiple heads grows in its place. And so often with compliance, we have too many people sending too many messages in too many different ways. That's exactly what this little talk bubble here is. There are too many people from too many departments sending me too many mess different messages about too many policies. I can't make sense of it all or keep myself organized. I remember going into COVID-19 in March of 2020, and I had an insurance company that called me up and said, we've got a problem. We just, we're moving to a work from home environment because of lockdowns of the pandemic. And we found out that we have 27 different policy portals in the organization. Some are file shares, some are SharePoint sites, some are commercial software. Uh, and at a time when we're trying to move people and support them in working from a home environment, we have policies that are changing, like home office expense policies, home office IT security policies. We have to remind people about other policies, like conduct policies, just because you're working from home. You know, the same rules apply as far as like harassment and discrimination and things like that in, in, in business meetings 
uh, you, just because you're wearing your pajama pants underneath the desk, different rules don't apply to you. You know, where we have to address the, the you know, like conduct rules and things. And the, the, this insurance company is saying, we, we found out we have 27 different policy portals at a time we need one portal. And we need to be able to um, have one easy access into all the policies of the organization. It's absolutely critical. But that's the challenge is we have too many people from too many organizations sending too many messages from, I'm sorry, too many people from too many departments doing pieces of compliance, sending too many messages in two different ways. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't work. It's fragmented and it's broken. And we have the challenge of the inevitability of failure. Too many documents and manual approaches uh, for compliance. That, that just mean that people are, that things can break down and not work. I was talking to one firm, they're spending 200 hours to build a report for the board of directors on compliance. 200 hours, that's one person at a 40 hour work week taking five weeks to build one report on compliance. That's not managing compliance, that's reacting to compliance. And the reason it took them so long was that they literally had hundreds to thousands of documents, spreadsheets, and emails related to compliance that they had to aggregate, tabulate, bring together, and build into this report. And to find out they had compliance issues that started 11 months ago and are out of control now. Another firm, this is a mid-sized bank, a small to mid-sized bank that I worked on their RFP for GRC software in this space. They did an internal study of their compliance resources, as well as audit resources, and found out that 80% of their staff time in the compliance function was nothing more than document reconcilers. Yeah, these compliance professionals, 80% of their staff time was chasing document spreadsheets and emails and not managing compliance. Hey, gosh, I went to law school and I, I, it took me a lot to get through law school. I didn't go to graduate school like that to be chasing document spreadsheets and emails. Neither did you. You want to manage compliance. There's better ways of doing it and it delivers on what we call defensible compliance that we're talking about today in this webinar. Now, if we look at some of the significant changes that have happened over the last several years in prosecution of companies when there's compliance issues, that the US Department of Justice has really focused on, and the regulators themselves, that if you cooperate with the regulator and law enforcement, and you disclose your compliance issue, and you can demonstrate that you have an effective compliance program, and we'll get into what an effective compliance program looks like, there's greater leniency on you. So if you cooperate and disclose and have an effective compliance program, it leads to greater leniency. Now, the US Department of Justice has the uh, Evaluation of Compliance Programs Guidelines, and they, they're updated every couple of years. Um, and, and so the most recent updates were two years ago, uh, June of 2020. And they, they are the framework that the U.S. Department of Justice uses to determine if they're going to prosecute a company. So uh, but, but to, to even un understand if they're going to prosecute a company, um, th th this is the framework they use to, to make that decision. And it has three fundamental steps with, with uh, points under each step. The first one, is the corporation's compliance program well designed? Does it look good on paper? This includes how we document and measure and manage compliance risks. Does the organization have the right policies and procedures for compliance? Does it have the right training and communications for compliance? Is there a confidential reporting structure like whistleblowers and hotline and investigation process? How is compliance managed across third-party relationships of vendors, suppliers, outsourcers, service providers, contractors, temporary workers, and more? And then also, how is compliance supposed to be managed during mergers and acquisitions? That's a checklist, but it's all about the design. Is the corporation's compliance program well designed? Does it have these elements and points in it uh, there? That's critically important. That's the fundamental piece. I mean, you can't have an operational compliance program unless you have a well-designed compliance program. And so the next question goes, is the program being applied earnestly and in good faith? In other words, is the program adequately resourced and empowered to function effectively? So the first question got into, is the compliance program properly designed? Does it look good on paper? The second question is, is there management support of it? Is there commitment by senior middle management? Does compliance have the right autonomy and resources? 
And this is an interesting one because there's been a big push by the regulators as well as um, the the court system. Uh, and, and But if you look at all the uh, consent decrees, deferred prosecution agreements, non-prosecution agreements, corporate integrity agreements of the last 15 years, you see that there's been a big trend where compliance comes outside of legal. That that, in, that uh, in these enforcement actions, that a lot of them, they actually require that compliance not report into legal. Now, I've seen good compliance programs report into legal, so I'm not trying to make a judgment call there specifically. But you know, from from the court perspective, you know, the, the, there's a whole perspective that um, legal's got the duty to deny and protect, while compliance has a duty to discover and fix, and these are at odds with each other. And so what you see from the courts, but also with, from law enforcement, is that does compliance have the right autonomy and resources? Does it have the, the ability to make the proper decisions and execute on those decisions, or is it being uh, quieted down because of where it's reporting? And are, is there proper, and are there proper incentives and disciplinary measures? The third question brings it all together. Does the corporation's compliance program work in practice? Does it actually work? Is it operational? You know, to me, this contrasts with the first question here. And I'll get out my little pen tool here. Is a corporation's compliance program well designed? Well, I can have a great program on paper. In fact, you know, I've got a, a code of conduct here on my laptop that in the year 2000, it was the model code of conduct. Other companies were copying it to be their code of conduct. In fact, I had a petroleum company from Canada at my policy management by design workshop that said, we nearly copied that code of conduct word for word to be our code of conduct because it was so beautifully crafted and worded. It was elegant. We love to read the prose of it. Now I'm just going on. But, but anyways, uh, I'm talking about Enron's code of conduct. I mean, you can have beautifully written policies and, and, and you can have everything look good on paper, but it doesn't mean it's operational. And we all know that Enron led to Sarbanes-Oxley um, 20 years ago. Uh, and, and so uh, they had a significant misconduct and follow their code of conduct. So the, the first question is, is the corporation's compliance program well designed? Do we have the right policies and procedures and, uh, and, and assessments and risks, uh, compliance risk documented and all that? The second is, is it empowered? But the third one, is it actually operational? You can have great things on paper, but is it actually working and being enforced? And this includes continuous improvement, periodic testing and review of compliance, being able to manage investigations of misconduct and follow it through, and provide analysis or remediation of any underlying misconduct. Now, what's really important in the Department of Justice guidelines is the fact that they actually really call out for audit trails of activities, uh, and, and particularly around things like policy and policy engagement. You know, with the Department of Justice Evaluation and Compliance Program guidelines specifically says, like on the policy portal, you know, can you see how many times, you know, a specific individual access to policy and how often they access the policy? That's absolutely critical is having that audit trail and system of record for defensible compliance. I would argue that you cannot have defensible compliance without that audit trail and system of record. And if you're haphazardly, you know, writing policies in documents and throwing them on file shares or SharePoint sites that have no configuration of an audit trail of access, you're gonna have a very, very, very hard time providing defensible compliance posture. You, you need good, strong technology that has that audit trail and system of record of all activities and interactions to defend the organization. Now, what I went through just uh, in the last few minutes was what we had on the left. Is the corporation's compliance program well-designed? Is the program being applied earnestly in good faith? And does the corporation's compliance program work in practice? And that's what the U.S. Department of Justice uses for evaluation of compliance programs to determine if they're going to prosecute a company. But let's quickly look at the other side of things. Let's say that they did prosecute the company, that they went through all these criteria and they ended up prosecuting a company, and the company was found guilty. What do the courts use? In other words, the U.S. Sentencing, United States Sentencing Commission Organizational Sentencing Practices. What do they use to determine the culpability of the organization? Well, they have a framework as well. And so if you're found guilty of compliance issues of a criminal nature um, as an individual or as a corporation, you know, this is what it finds to determine, you know, how severe of a penalty you're going to get. Uh, and and th these are mitigating factors. If you have these in the positive, they are 
um, you know, factors that work against you if they're in the negative. And, and so first is clear oversight, accountability, and resources. Is there somebody in charge of compliance, somebody that's accountable, that, that's responsible day to day to uh, that compliance area? The second one is standards and controls, otherwise policies and procedures and controls. Is compliance well documented in the environment? The third one is effective training and communication. You know, you can have great doc documents and policies, but if people aren't aware of them, why even have them? So the third element of the seven elements of an effective compliance program by the U.S. Sensing Commission, Organizational Sensing Practices, is there an effective training and communication program. The fourth element is there good evaluation, monitoring, and auditing. Are you doing compliance assessments? Are you monitoring compliance? Are you providing assurance on compliance? The fifth one is the enforcement, discipline, and incentives around compliance. The sixth one is making sure you have due care and delegating authorities that you're not giving access to sensitive information and processes to individuals that have a bent towards criminal behavior, that there's proper background checks and due diligence on individuals before you hire them or give them access in certain areas. And then the seventh one is, is there a response and continuous improvement? Are you having repeated compliance issues and violations because you don't learn your lessons or, or do you learn your from your lessons and improve? And there's actually an eighth habit that is talking about compliance risk assessment that that's done as well. But you know, on one side you have what would the framework for what the law enforcement uses to determine if they're gonna go after a company uh, and prosecute them. On the right side, you've got what the courts use once a company is found guilty that determines scaling factors on the, the uh, fines and prison sentences of individuals and corporations, fines of corporations and prison sentences of individuals and vice versa. Now, let's look at this in practice. And my favorite case goes back a decade. And this is the Morgan Stanley case. Um, and this is a case study and effective compliance program that brings these out. Now, just for background purposes here, th this is 2012. This is 35 years into FCPA history, Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. The FCPA was passed in 1977. Uh, and so 35 years into its history, this is the first time that we know that a company had bribery and corruption happening. Mr. Peterson in the Asian real estate business was doing bad things. But it was the first time that the, the Department of Justice and the SEC looked at a company and did not prosecute the company. They still prosecuted Mr. Peterson, the bad guy but they didn't prosecute the company. First time in 35 years of FCPA existence that happened. Instead, there's a memo praising Morgan Stanley's compliance program that is still up on, their, on the Department of Justice website today. And it says, Morgan Stanley maintained a system of internal controls meant to ensure accountability for its assets and to prevent employees from offering, promising, or paying anything of value to foreign government officials. So first off, Morgan Stanley had controls for compliance, internal controls for compliance. Um, and those controls were documented in place. Then Morgan Stanley's internal policies, which were updated regularly to reflect regulatory developments and specific risks, prohibited bribery and addressed corruption risks associated with the giving of gifts, business entertainment, travel, lodging, meals, charitable contributions, and employment. So the, the second key element here is Morgan Stanley had policies and Morgan Stanley can demonstrate how these policies were kept current as different uh, regulations change and risks change in the environment. Next, Morgan Stanley frequently trained its employees on its internal policies, the FCPA and other anti-corruption laws. Between 2002 and 2008, Morgan Stanley trained various groups of Asia-based personnel on anti-corruption policies 54 times. During the same period, Morgan Stanley trained uh, Mr. Peterson on the FCPA seven times and reminded him to comply with the FCPA at least 35 times. There you go, documented audit trail and system of record of how many times employees, including Mr. Peterson, were reminded of policies and trained on policies. Do you have that? You, can you pull into your record and uh, uh, in your compliance system and show up how many times people access policies or trained on policies, reminded of policies, attested to policies? That's absolutely critical in defending yourself. Then Morgan Stanley's compliance personnel regularly monitored transactions, randomly audited particular employees, transactions and business units, and tested to identify illicit payments. That's getting into compliance assessments and monitoring. Moreover, Morgan Stanley conducted extensive due diligence on all new business partners and imposed stringent controls on payments made to business partners. 
that, that that's getting into the third party aspect of vendors and suppliers. When you deal with FCPA enforcement, nearly every FCPA issue that's come to rise and prosecuted, like over 90% of them, involves third parties in some way. And so are you doing, are you managing compliance across the extended enterprise of vendors and suppliers and outsourcers and service providers? Now, the whole point here is, is Morgan Stanley had this documented evidence trail of compliance, the system of record that got them out of trouble in this case. And the question for you is, do you have this? Can you produce a documented evidence trail of act, uh, audit trail and system of record of all your compliance interactions, assessments, policy communications, policy access, reminders, training, and so forth? A lot of organizations cannot. So one of the things we desperately need is compliance accountability. And that's different from responsibility. Responsibility is I can pass around the organization like a hot potato. Responsibilities I can give are like tasks I can give to somebody else. Accountability, I cannot. Accountability means I own this. If there's an issue, I have to answer for it. And, and so accountability is different from responsibility. I can outsource responsibilities, but I cannot outsource accountability. There's a subtle and very powerful difference. Another key thing to think about compliance is integrity. At the end of the day, compliance is more than regulatory um, compliance, but it's about the integrity of the organization. If I could rebrand the chief ethics and compliance officer, the CECO, or maybe you just call that person the chief, ethics, the chief compliance officer, the CCO, to me, that, that is really the CIO, but we already have a CIO and the chief information officer, but I'm talking about the chief integrity officer. Compliance done right is about the integrity of the organization. It's not just compliance to the letter of the law, but it's about the values and ethics and commitment of the organization. I'm here in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and uh, just a few blocks from me is the Northwestern Mutual Building. I remember several years ago going to the Northwestern Mutual Building and having a conversation with their chief privacy officer. And, and it's a conversation I'll never forget because the chief privacy officer at Northwestern Mutual told me that privacy at Northwestern Mutual isn't just about compliance to laws and regulations, that they build it greater than that. It's about the integrity of doing the right thing for the client. The chief privacy officer up on her wall at the time had the, the mission statement from uh, Northwestern Mutual dating back to the 1800s. And on this mission statement, I don't remember the exact words. I wish I would have taken a picture of it, but it said, we're here to do the right thing for the customer. And she said that our compliance program for privacy is exactly that. It's not about EU GDPR, California CCPA or anything like that. It's about doing the right thing for the customer. And that's what we focus on for privacy. It's not just crossing you know, our T's and dotting our I's and checking check boxes. We wanna build our privacy program around integrity that we're doing the right thing for our uh, customer. And compliance is a natural fallout of that. Compliance comes naturally. But the question I have for you, when you're approaching compliance, how, where are you? Are you communicating to the world something that you're not? That you, you everything looks good on paper, but a, operationally it's a mess or just missing good strong compliance is about integrity that what you communicate to the world are your values your ethics your commitments to regulatory obligations and contractual obligations that's a reality in the organization another key point is that compliance happens at all levels of the organization yeah, and compliance engagement needs to be measured at all levels of the organization from the top executives what was communicated to them what did they know well, what, what, do they have clear visibility into compliance? Down to middle management and the frontline employees. You know, the doctor and nurse at a hospital are making patient safety and patient privacy decisions every day. That teller at the bank is making uh, cu uh, customer uh, privacy decisions. They're making uh, um, fraud, cash handling, money laundering, you know, compliance decisions every day. Those frontline employees are critically important. But so is the middle, too, the middle management. I remember years ago interacting with a chief information security officer at a large high-tech firm. And this, this, this global high-tech hardware manufacturer was having problems because uh, of, of getting in, uh, individuals through information security awareness training. 
And he realized that it wasn't, you know, an, a far end employee, the frontline employee problem, it was a middle management problem. That the middle managers thought, we're a good company, we've got good values and ethics and things like that. You know, this is just a waste of time. Just do the right thing. And, and they were telling their employees they didn't have to do that, the, the training. And so the, this uh, um, chief information security officer actually focused a quarterly webinar on middle management. And to be able to tell them that, you know, uh, the number of IT security issues, compliance issues, uh, hackers, viruses, viruses, hackers and worms, oh my, you know, all, all the different incidents by category and their impact on uh, this high tech manufacturer. Within one year, that chief information security officer completely changed the understanding and awareness of the importance for information security awareness training for compliance to those uh, middle managers and people were starting to complete it and, and the, 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 the metrics and numbers got to where they needed to be. But culture is critical, our compliance culture. Uh, I'm an honorary life member and global ambassador of risk for the Institute of Risk Management out of London. And several years ago, we published this whole guidance called Risk Culture Resources for Practitioners. In it, we have the ABC model and it applies so well to compliance today. The attitudes of the frontline employees, like the teller at the bank, or even middle management or senior executives, those attitudes shapes the behavior of the organization and transactions and interactions. And that forms the, the, the corporate culture of the bank or credit union. And that has a symbiotic relationship of further influencing further attitudes and behavior. Now, culture can spin out of control overnight. You can go from good culture to corrupt culture in a day with the wrong things happening. But it can take years or even a decade to repair culture. Culture is an extremely important asset. And from a compliance perspective, we need to nurture it. And this gets into good policies, communication, training and awareness, and, and nurturing that culture in the organization. When it comes to a compliance program, there's no such thing as a one size fits all. What works good for one company is different from another company. You know, a global bank that has to deal with 257 regulatory change events from 1,217 regulators around the world, their compliance program is gonna look a little different from a credit union operating in one city. And, and so where compliance reports, how it reports, the structure, the staffing, all that, varies by size and complexity of an organization and even the company culture and things like that. Uh, and and we, we've seen this a lot with challenger banks disrupting, you know, the traditional brick and mortar banks and, and as well as they reinvent compliance and how it's done and automating it more. <clears throat> but you need a suitable and scalable compliance system that meets your specific organization, your culture, your size. But what's needed under the hood is a good strategy, define compliance processes, and a solid information technology architecture that can deliver on compliance, particularly that accountability and audit trails and workflows and tasks and part of that documented uh, system of record and audit trail. Now, policies are a backbone for compliance defensibility. Now, policies are governance, risk management, and compliance documents. They're governance documents first. In fact, I've interacted and worked with Starbucks as well as Suncor Energies. Both of them call their policy management program their governance documents program. Because policies help us reliably achieve objectives. They provide consistent operations and behavior and transactions and interactions. You know, can you imagine accounting uh, within a company that doesn't have accounting policies like accounts payable, accounts receivable, procurement policies? It's completely a mess. Policies define consistent processes, behavior, and transactions. They're governance documents. But policies are also risk management documents. The very fact that there's a policy means there's a risk. In fact, that risk was great enough that somebody had to sit behind a word processor and write a document and call it a policy to address that risk. There would never be a policy unless there's a risk. And that risk was significant enough that we had to do something about it. Now the challenge is a lot of banks and credit unions don't even know what policies they have because they're scattered in different file shares and SharePoint sites and HR's got their policies and accounting's got their policies and IT's got their policies and nobody has that singular policy portal that should be there and is needed. 
Um, in fact, I was uh, keynoting at a conference a couple of years back. It was before COVID-19. And there's 200 people in the room. And I asked the question that uh, um, who in the room, if the regulator, uh, external auditor, opposing counsel in a lawsuit, whoever it might be, the law enforcement, if they want to see a master index of every one of your policies, anything that's an official policy from code of conduct all the way down to HR and IT policies, that you can produce a master record of all your policies. Two people out of 200 raised their hand. So many organizations don't even know what policies they have for compliance, let alone map them to risks. Then, of course, policies are compliance documents. They help us have integrity and address compliance requirements and behavior in the organization. So effective and defensible compliance means that we have clear compliance engagement and communication, that we establish our goals for compliance, whether it's privacy compliance, IT security compliance, anti-money laundering compliance, anti-bribery and corruption compliance, HR compliance around harassment, discrimination, inclusivity, diversity, you know, what are our goals? What are we trying to achieve in this area of compliance? Well, who is our audience? Are there high risk roles, moderate risk roles, no risk roles? You know, the, the level of detail and training that a bank teller gets is going to be different from somebody that's cleaning up the trash uh, and, 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 and cleaning the, the, the bank branch. Now, both need like things like privacy training because you're going to find printouts and in, in, uh, different in information lay, laying around. But the level of scenarios and training and depth of communication varies on audience role and risk exposure to the bank or credit union. And so can we segment our audience in different levels? And then do we have the right resources to address this compliance? And how do we leverage technology to deliver communication of policies and attestations and awareness and training? What about accessibility? You know, is our compliance training and engagement um, uh, uh, accessible to those with disabilities? Or what about those that have, uh, that don't, that might speak another language and then don't have English as a, a primary language? Um, and how do we measure effectiveness and, and do quizzing, testing, and awareness of compliance? How do we align our communication engagement so that we can streamline things and, and not send your people to 20 hours of compliance training every week of the year? Uh, and do we have right stakeholders to engage and back us up and support the program? From there, once we build our compliance uh, plan, uh, compliance communication engagement plan, we need to execute on it. And there's times that it's just simple that we need to make people aware there's a new policy or there's an update to the policy that's out there. And in and, and, and our system of record and accountability trails for defensible compliance, we're just making may, noting that we sent an email out to everybody, making them aware that there's a you know, slight modification to such and such policy. Now, then there's a little bit higher risk area. You know, in which we not only need to make people aware there's a new policy, but we need to get some type of acknowledgement that they read and understood the policy, that they read through it and they clicked on the button that, and signed their name uh, on it. And But then there's even higher risk area that not only do we need to distribute and make people aware there's a policy and get their acknowledgement, attestation, read and understood, certification, whatever you want to call it, we actually need to send them through training on this. And different roles might have different levels of these. There might be some that just need just broader awareness of like a privacy policy. Others need to be attestation. And high-risk roles that are interacting like a personal information day in and day out need that training on it as well. Now, I'm very involved with OSEG, the Open Compliance and Ethics Group. I'm one of their GRC fellows. And I partnered with OSEG in developing policymanagementpro.com, which has a whole policy certification course on the Certified Policy Management Professional and, and education and it's got the, 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 the policy management capability model, <coughs> which is before you here. And, and I helped author this and produce this content. But policies are critical and engagement on policies for defensible compliance. And it starts with govern in defining our policy roles like policy author, subject matter expert, policy owner, uh, and the standards, like the meta policy, which is also called the policy and writing policies and style guides and templates. From the govern of the policy management program flows the develop, where we work on the, the, the assessment, the need for a new policy or the update to an existing policy, and the authoring and approval and review process. But once a policy is authored and approved, it gets into communicate. And we plan that engagement of employees and the different risk factors on who, what level we engage, different roles, and the delivery of the policy 
uh, uh, communication, attestation, and training program. Then it moves into enforce, where we implement that policy, we monitor it, and make sure that it's being followed and adhered to, and we document and manage exceptions. That's absolutely critical. If the regulator or external auditors are coming to you and they find exceptions to your password policy or your gift entertainment policy or political contribution policy or whatever it might be, you know, those are all red flags if you don't have documented evidence that they're gonna find more and they should start keep digging. But if you can show them, yeah, we're fully aware that there's an exception to that password policy and, and here's the reason why and, and here's the exception, who approved the exception, when they approved it, why they approved it, and, and basically it's approved because that's that critical business system doesn't support the strong password policy because it's a legacy system, whatever it might be. Exception document, defensible compliance requires that exceptions to policies and controls be documented in the environment. And then finally that moves to the improve where we revise our policies and maintain them and redesign them as necessary. Now good defensible compliance is going to mean that we have a strong information architecture for compliance like our host Quantibate today, that we can clearly define our objectives, map our compliance risks to our objectives, the controls that are in place so we can reliably achieve objectives, but also mitigate those risks. When you have a risk, like a compliance risk, let's, let's say IT privacy or, or privacy, you know, you, you might have your inherent risk on a heat map, and then you, imp then you want to get to a residual risk that's an acceptable risk. How do you do that? You implement controls. And so if we implement a, B, and C controls, we move that inherent risk, which is high, down to a low risk, which is we find acceptable. And so the, the controls map to risks, and they're extremely important. Issues, incidents, cases, and investigations tells us where we're getting risk exposure, where controls are failing or missing or needed. Roles include subject matter experts or compliance risk owners. Policies, you know, as I mentioned, every policy maps to a risk in the environment, but a lot of organizations don't even have an inventory of their policies, let alone map them to risks. Policies govern controls. Your password policy tells you length of password, frequency of change of password, complexity of password. Those are all controls to get in your environment. Your credit risk policy tells you the amount of credit and, and the credit score and, and, and worthiness of an individual that you can extend credit to. Those are controls to get implemented in your environment. Your gift entertainment and hospitality and political contribution policies tell you the amount of a gift, the frequency you can give that gift, over what period of time you can give that gift. Those are all controls that can implement in your ERP and transaction environment. Your regulatory obligations change your risk exposure. Those regulatory obligations specifically mandates controls that need to be implemented. Issues need to be reported back to the regulators. They, uh, those regulatory, those regulations might indicate when Policies need, need to be revised and then kick in the role of subject matter expert to review those policies. Now, if you're managing all these different components and different documents, spreadsheets, and emails, it's a recipe for disaster. You're gonna find that it takes 200 hours to build that compliance report for the board of directors. And by the time you get it done, you find out you had compliance issues nine months ago. Uh, and, and you have isolated systems and things like policies may be managed in file shares and controls are being and risks are being managed in spreadsheets. You, you fail to get this intersection of knowledge. You know, why are we having all those issues, cases, investigations? Are we hiring bad, wicked, evil people that want to do bad things? Maybe, but most often you find that there's a policy awareness problem, like that high tech firm that I said. You know, that, that employees aren't going through uh, reading the policies and going through training on the policies that you have an awareness problem and it's not bad people, it's, it's a bad policy communication engagement program. You know, when you have an information architecture like our host Quantivate, you can start to see these insights and relationships and deliver defensible compliance in your organization. Good technology in this area should provide good insight where there's a consistent repository for policies, a consistent repository for compliance risks, a com consistent repository for assessment of, of, con of compliance controls and risks, a uh, consistent repository for managing investigations, cases, complaints, issues, and so forth, so that you can provide consistency, accountability, and automation through workflow and tasks and forms and processing and reporting of the, in the organization. Good compliance technology provides automation and tracking, where there's strong management reporting, where that, that management reporting doesn't take 200 hours to build that report. It's there at a push of a button when needed. You know, that, that instead of 200 hours to build that compliance report for the board directors, I can get it to you in a minute, maybe five minutes, 
maybe 30 seconds, but it's there, it's real time. I can get insight and dashboards and not 200 hours later. You have the right audit trail and system of record of activities and interactions on who read a policy, who did an assessment, who answered an assessment, what, what exceptions were documented out there. Workflow and tasks to make things sure things don't get missed. Collaboration, so across different compliance departments that can work together so that we have a consistent policy portal across the whole entire organization and enforcement and monitoring of controls and policies for compliance, where there's greater accountability, automation, the repository consistency. All of these are critical. But at the end of the day, and the focus of our webinar today is that defensible compliance, that system of record and audit trail of accountability and interactions. What policy was communicated on what date and time? Did, did that employee uh, attest to the policy that read and understood? Did they go through the training? Do we have audit trail and system of record that how many times that employee went out to the policy portal and accessed that policy, attested the policy, interacted in that policy? That's in the Department of Justice Evaluation and Compliance Program guidelines. It's right there. You know, what compliance assessment was done on what date and time? What were the findings from that? Do we meet our compliance requirements? Were there exceptions to specific controls or policies out there? Were they documented? All this is defensible compliance, that audit trail and system of record. And my friends, document spreadsheets and emails don't deliver on this. I can completely manufacture evidence of compliance in spreadsheets and documents. You need a, a strong database architecture that, that can say when, when, what, and how on that audit trail uh, of activities. And so if somebody come, tries to come back and cover a trail and modify a compliance assessment, there's a date and time stamp. This is what it said. This is what was changed, who changed it, what time they changed it. You know, you don't get that level of audit trail and system of record and document spreadsheets and emails. They fail for compliance. It's called the inevitability of failure in my mind. You know, you need a strong database information architecture to document and provide defensible compliance and audit trail for your organization. Strong technology in this space is usable, not just for the back office compliance functions, but the front office, the engagement to the frontline employees on policies, assessments, and controls. From there, there's a lower total cost of ownership where you can be able to manage compliance through its overall uh, implementation uh, of the software to the ongoing management of the software. It's configurable and adaptable and scalable to your size of organization and can grow with you. It can integrate with other systems and provides the right analytics, process automation, and doesn't break on upgrades. It also provides the right dashboards and metrics. How many questions are coming in around ambiguity and clarity on compliance and policies? Now, th th this is important because some questions mean people are aware there's a compliance hotline where they can call and get questions answered. But you get too many questions, and you know what? It's telling you where that com that there's a lot of ambiguity and clarity issues in that policy, maybe that policy needs to be revised if a lot of people are asking the same question. Do we have all of our compliance processes and assessments and policies and controls properly approved and monitored? Are they, are they meeting our current risk exposure as that change? Has regulations, legislation, external risk, or business change required changes in our policies and our approach in this area? What are issues and incidents telling us? Are they telling us we're hiring bad, wicked, evil people? Or are they telling us we're our compliance training program and engagement needs to change because people weren't aware that they need to be doing things a certain way and they weren't doing it that way because they were never trained or educated properly. Exceptions, are exceptions being documented? Are we getting too many exceptions? If we have too many exceptions to a policy, it's no longer a policy, it's a guideline. It goes from you, thou shalt to you should. You know, and so some exceptions are allowable, not for every policy. I mean, you're not going to give an exception to harassment and discrimination policies that says that manager can harass people or discriminate and nobody else can. I, unfortunately, I think that some organizations work that way, but that shouldn't happen. But, you know, there are some policies and controls that do get exceptions, like gift entertainment, hospitality, password policies, and other IT security policies like encryption policies, because there's legacy systems that can't support it. Are they documented? And, you know, what are the metrics around non-compliance, delivery of engagement on policies and training and attestations and other compliance communications? These are all important metrics that the right software can be able to measure and track to provide for defensible compliance in your bank and credit union. But in conclusion, I want to go through a couple slides here on what I think is the most critical theme for your organization to address in defending and providing a strong culture of compliance in your organization. And that is 
the human firewall. It's essential to banks and credit unions. We all, most of us on the on this uh, you know webinar, probably understand firewalls from the network security firewalls that protect our networks from the hackers and viruses and worms. Oh my! Uh, and there's other firewalls like, like where firewalls actually got their name. There's firewalls within buildings that can stop fire from spreading. There, there's firewalls in your car between a, the passenger department compartment and the engine compartment that, that protects the passenger compartment from the heat of the engine. Now, the other firewall that's critically important protection, well, I think one of the most important firewalls is the human firewall. The employees out there, that teller at the bank or credit union, that bank manager, you know, the, whoever it might be, those frontline employees are a firewall to the organization. They're making compliance decisions on customer privacy and money, ha and cash handling and fraud and money laundering, anti-money laundering and all these day in and day out. They're one of the most essential areas that we need to protect in the organization is the human firewall. To build a human firewall, it starts with policies and procedures. You need well written and maintained policies. You, you need to make sure policies are written at a level that can be engaged by the employees in your organization and understood. You know, I was reading a Fortune 100 company supply chain code of conduct several years ago, and I was floored. It was written in the in the passive voice, not the active voice. So long paragraphs and complex language, including legalese, uh, you know, and it was going to an international audience, much of which has English as a second language. So just how we're writing the policies means that they're going to be harder to understand. You know, it was it was lazy writing. And for and what really surprised me was the first uh, paragraph says company believes. The second paragraph says company strongly believes. So we have different level belief, uh, different levels of belief in the code of conduct. I don't think so, but that's what was communicating. So we need well-written policies, policies that can be understood by their audience. That's absolutely critical. <clears throat> but policies themselves aren't enough because we need to be able to engage people on policy, make them aware that there's policies out there for compliance. And that's where policy communication, attestation, uh, and acknowledgement come into play here. Uh, and that there's, a, again, I reference back to the Department of Justice evaluation and compliance program guidelines because it specifically talks about that audit trail and system of record of those policy interactions and engagement on policies. <clears throat> but jobs are complex. And, and you go to the bank teller, credit union teller, they've got a lot of different scenarios going through of with, when, uh, if, when, how, why uh, to apply that policy. And that's where compliance training awareness becomes essential in developing the human firewall is making sure people understand how to apply that policy in different circumstances and interactions. You know, so the compliance training awareness is absolutely critical. But guess what? The best laid plans of mice and men will fail, John Steinbeck tells us. So what also is important is being able to not, to, when we communicate policies and train people on compliance, that you tell them how to report issues, the hotline, whistleblower systems, management reports, because if we're, we're, if we're actually engaging our employees in what good compliance culture looks like, they become aware. And they're saying, that transaction looks suspicious. You know, that interaction I saw with that employee, that employee, that shouldn't have happened. That crossed the line of harassment, discrimination, whatever it might be. You know, if we educate and train our employees they become finders of non-compliance out there that can tell us where things are, are going wrong and alert us before they become big things. And we can contain them when they're still small things. We, the part of the human firewall is that issue and incident reporting and the whole investigation incident management process. But another important element is the extended enterprise. The modern organization, even a small bank and credit union, you know, is extended with suppliers and vendors and contractors, consultants and outsourcers and service providers and temporary workers, and they have access to your processes and systems, your information, and their compliance issues are your compliance issues. So part of engagement on compliance and, and building defensible records, making sure you have that defensible record across your extended third-party relationships as well. This is absolutely critical. In some areas, you want to deliver policies and training to individuals and third parties. 
But at a minimum, you want to make sure you do the right background checks and assessments and uh, due diligence on engaging those third parties as you give them access to your enterprise and systems and processes. So you can mitigate your compliance risk exposure. And if you have an issue, you can say, we did our due diligence, here it all is here, something bad still happened. You know, just like Morgan Stanley. Morgan Stanley had a bad apple. Mr. Peterson was hired. Uh, but uh, the, the Department of Justice and SEC went after Mr. Peterson and not Morgan Stanley in that case I shared with you a bit ago. So with that, we have 10 minutes left here for Q&A. And so I'd like to turn this over to our host to see if we have any questions that came in today. Um, thanks, Michael. That was great. Looking at the question box, it doesn't like we look like we have anything right now. So if you do have a question, go over to your control panel and you can submit one now so we can review. Well, for those that are thinking about it, and maybe this presentation is going to keep you awake tonight, and you're going to be thinking about everything that I said, and all of a sudden a question comes to your mind at 2 a.m. in the morning, you've got my email address right there. Or you can send me a LinkedIn message or whatever it is. I'm, I'm happy to interact with your questions as they come to mind after the fact as well. Awesome. Thanks, Michael. Well, with that, we will wrap up today. I just want to thank everybody for attending. Thanks, Michael, for your expertise, and we will see you all next time.